Hey everybody, welcome to the podcast. My guest today is Bonnie Sui. She is the author of a really beautiful new book called Why We Swim. I loved it. This is a conversation about swimming, of course. It's about human beings' relationship to the water through survival and community and flow. And speaking of flow, this conversation does just that. I really enjoyed it, hope you do too. So hit that subscribe button and please enjoy my conversation with Bonnie Soy. So nice to meet you. Thank you for doing this. It's such a pleasure. I'm so glad to meet you. I appreciate you coming down from Northern California, and I'm so glad that you jumped in the ocean today. Like I said <laughs> before we started, I would have been horribly You'd disappointed, been disappointed if you right? didn't go swimming I had before to. our conversation about swimming. It was uh, it was one of those, you know, really beautiful sunrises. I mean, you, you kind of get jaded living down here, I think, mm. in California specifically. Jaded. Too. Jaded. And uh, I paddled out this morning. I took a photo and I sent it to a friend who lives here. Uh -huh. And he said, I think we talked about it sort of like maybe puncturing his like jaded heart. <laughs> yeah. Even 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 uh, even his after being out here, he could. Well, enjoy there's a it. lot of reasons to complain about Los Angeles, but the beaches and the weather is not one of them. Yeah. Not when bad. I see, you know, when I hear you talking about surfing at Ocean Beach, like I used to live in San Francisco, I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> so cold and like unforgiving and uninviting on some level <laughs> compared to what it is you get a battle. Down here. It's a battle to yeah, get out. I but think. that's part of the thing, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, I think about it, I like to think about it as, um, making a date to like go wrestling with the ocean mm -hmm. <laughs> in the morning. And I expect it, right? At OB, you always yeah. expect that it's going to be somewhat hellacious, even mm -hmm. on a, an easy, low, you know, baby day. But um, but I kind of like that. I kind of like um, being challenged. And I partly am okay with it because um, my my surf buddy, Caroline Paul, she's um, she is one of the first, she was one of the first female firefighters in San Francisco. Oh, and wow. so she's just like this, you know, she's a pilot, she's just tough. And she um, has basically had like nine, 10, 11, 12 lives of, of adventure. Uh -huh. And she will go out and look, stand on the beach looking out. And every time she goes, it doesn't look that bad. Every <laughs> no time, matter what. no matter what, it yeah. could be, you know, overhead, double overhead and she'll just say, it doesn't look that bad. And then, so we'll go, we'll try it, you know, we'll be repelled back. We'll be, yeah. you know, booted out of uh, the whitewater. But uh, I think just like having that mindset is a good way to be. And I, and I like that about. It kind of gets thing. easier the more you do it, but it never quite gets easy enough. Like the yeah. number of times, you know, I couldn't count the number of times I've stood on an outdoor pool deck in ridiculously cold weather, staring at the pool, knowing that the water in the pool is warmer than the water in the air and uh -huh. still being unable to like <laughs> jump in that like that like moment where you're just staring at it going, how am I gonna get into this water? It's breaking the seal, right? Yeah. You know, it, it, it's still the membrane. It's like an invisible membrane between you right. and it. And yet it's, it, I think that it takes something, it takes some activation energy to break that seal every time, no mm -hmm. matter what. Right. But um, it's always worth it, right? You yeah, know, always. Side. You're never like, oh, I wish I hadn't done that. Yeah. Are the pools still all closed up north? They are, they've started to reopen. So my local pool, the Albany Aquatic Center, um, sort of just north of me in Berkeley, mm -hmm. um, that's sort of my home pool. And I, um, it didn't reopen until very recently. Right. Like month, two months. And, um, so I just ended up swimming in the bay for uh -huh. the last eight months or surfing. Did they cl didn't they close Aquatic Park also? They did. Yeah. Yeah, they did because I think too many people were going there in the beginning. Mm. And then they closed the Dolphin Club and the South End Rowing Club, the facilities. So even now, you know, I have friends who- I mean, that seems like pretty low risk. But I think in the beginning, it seemed- Right. Just the flock, we didn't know enough. Right, then, right, right, right. So there's the flocking together. But now we know, of course, being outside, uh -huh. great. You know, in the water, ocean breezes, great. Like, keep doing it. Survive, yeah. get through this, you know. There's a couple pools that are open down here, but they've all migrated to these online platforms where you have to reserve you have a lane. To make, yeah. You know, you got to You've been like, doing that, right? I have, but 
I, every time I look at, I log in and all the, everything's booked. Yeah, like it's you gotta like be zero, way zero, ahead zero. of it. And I never know, <laughs> like, I just like to go, I'm like, oh, I got I, I got an open hour, I'm gonna go do it. Like, uh -huh. I, it's difficult for me to know day to day. Right. So the other week I like booked a lane every single day at different times throughout <laughs> the day. And I didn't make it once because there oh, was some no. intervening You just were throwing a bunch of things on the wall. Yeah, because it's a long drive actually from my house too. And uh, yeah. it's just, you know, I'm I'm struggling with um, how to I did that the out. exact same thing that you just did this morning. You did. Because they opened up and I said, I'm just gonna, this one's open, this one's open. I'll just, you know, snatch it and Grab see. them, yeah. 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 Sometimes I show up without a reservation just to see if somebody doesn't show up because I've missed so many. I assume right. other people are having the right. same issue. Any luck? I'm hit or miss with that. <laughs> I know. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm so glad to talk to you about my very favorite subject, swimming and the human relationship with water. And this book that you created is just a, a beautiful work of art. It must be incredibly gratifying to have it be so well received. I mean, making the Time 100 must read books of 2020. I mean, that's <laughs> that incredible, right? It As was. a writer, if somebody's been writing for a very long time, that's uh, that's quite the accolade. Yeah, you know, I, of course, um, I've been thinking about this book for many years before I decided to write it and, and figure out how to frame such a big topic, right? Mm -hmm. Swimming is is a topic. It's not a, it's not a book. It's not a story. It's not a narrative. And I had to provide that and I had to figure out how to do that in a way that felt right to me. And to see it finally out in the world, and of course I could never have imagined that it would come out into the world during a time when most people actually couldn't go swimming, right. was just very strange. And um, and then of course, the you know, over the months, I mean, it came out in April, the hardcover, and then it will, it came, it sort of rolled out around the world um, in the summer, and then mm -hmm. will, the paperback will come out this coming April. But to have then the gift of those months where people were thinking about their relationship to swimming in a way that they always had, they'd always taken it for granted. They'd never interrogated why mm. it made them feel good. They would just show up at the pool, you know, do their workout, see their friends and go home. Basically did right. not enter their minds because we didn't have to do things like make lane reservations, you know, right. two weeks out to get some time with the water. Um, and to get these, I've gotten the most incredible letters from people. Just, I mean, I, it's, it's, I would never have thought that um, the book would get people to swim in open water. You know, mm -hmm. that wasn't, it wasn't, I didn't have any uh, specific intentions. Yeah, like there's that. no agenda. Like there's that. no agenda, exactly. It was meant to be this, um, you know, this cultural and scientific exploration of our human relationship with water and with swimming and how it's so curious that we, um, who we as a species are not born knowing how to swim. We have to be taught. That's a very interesting thing about us, about us humans and of, about, you know, higher order primates. Um, right. You make the point that we're the only land mammal that doesn't instinctively know how to swim yeah. already. And I'd never really thought about that. Think about, I mean, I, once I started to um, look into this and I, um, you know, in the book, I list examples of, you know, dogs, cats, cats hate water, but they, they can swim. Right. Bats can swim. Bats can, can do a, a crazy like butterfly. It, it's insane. Really? Yeah. It, I look look after we finish talking. Please Google Some YouTube bats rabbit swimming. Hole. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. It's just um, so we have this. Um, you know, we're, we 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 came from the water, but we're not suited to it anymore. So we have to sort. We've been kind of clawing our way back to it mm. as land animals, and um, and and part of it is of course, survival, but also it is so much more than that. Once you learn how to survive the water, it can be so many things. And that's sort of how I laid out the book. You know, the question is presented in the title, Why We Swim. And then it's structured in these five thematic ways we can answer that question. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to get at all of that because I wanted it to be this expansive and really inviting, um, an invitation to, to come in the water right. and look at it. I took it to be very like sort of um, a swimming version of 
Chris McDougal's Born to Run. In <laughs> that many was my, ways. I, I joke with him about it. That was oh, my do? goal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Meets, uh, there's a little bit of Murakami, you know, what I think about when I think about running. It's like a swimming version of that. Wow. The thank Born you. to Run thing. But with the Born to Run thing, though, it would have been great if you found some undiscovered indigenous <laughs> tribe somewhere of super swimmers. That'd be too, yeah. that'd be too, yeah. you know, too much of a nail on the head, right? <laughs> right. But it, but it has that vibe. It has that, that feel to it. And, you know, I'm somebody who's, who's passionate about the water and somebody who's had a, a, you know, on a personal level, had a relationship to swimming from as long back as I can remember. And mm-hmm. I've thought deeply about it and I've written, you know, snippets about it over time. I wrote my college essay about you did. what it feels like to be like underwater, you know, like I, this so is something great. I've been thinking about for a long time, but never thought about what that might look like in an expanded, you know, comprehensive mm-hmm. um version of and you captured it perfectly like it's the perfect book that fires on all cylinders and it is this weird Thank you. like when you telescope up and look at humanity's relationship to water over time like there's an anthropological kind of aspect to your book there's this push pull like we're drawn to the water mm-hmm. you know coastal you know real estate is expensive for a reason right. like there's something about being by the water that that appeals to us mm-hmm. in, on a very profound level and we're also terrified of it and repelled by it. So it's that tension yeah. that makes it interesting. I really wanted to get at that. I mean, I wanted it to be a book that was not just for swimmers, but for people who didn't don't call themselves that, don't think of themselves that way. And why is that, right? It, there, it's because of this tension that you speak of between life and death, you know, immersion, submersion, flotation, like this this kind of, I talk about in the book, this porousness between states that I think is like, it's the, um, it's what's so enigmatic about the water and so alluring. And that we want, you know, we see of this gorgeous sparkling body of water, we want to get in it. I mean, mm-hmm. kids, you look at babies, like they just are just in the bathtub, right. you know, they're just enamored with it because it's, it is not of us. It's not for us necessarily. You know, we need water to survive. We need it, obviously. But um, when we see it around us in our environment, there's just something that is talking to us on a very essential level. And I wanted to explore that a bit. So what do you make of that? Like, what is that? (laughs) Well, I was really interested to, um, you know, in the course of my research, discover that our brain activity changes with the sound of water, seeing water, you know, we know about how we respond to green spaces, right? We, as humans, just, um, are, there are set points in the environment that we respond to. I mm-hmm. think there's um, a great book by Florence Williams called The Nature Fix. And she talks about how we are, we are evolutionarily um, suited to respond to certain set points in the environment. And that makes sense, right? So we, um, you know, being in the forest, being by the water. And so we have always known this on some level, right? So the books and, you know, philosophers and writers Mm -hmm. and um, poets since time immemorial have all spoken about. Right. You talk about the Greeks. Yeah. You know, the the water cure. The samurai, which we're going to get into. Right. And so once you start looking, you realize it's everywhere. It's everywhere across time. And so... I was very interested to know um, and wanted to to learn a little bit more about the science that's starting to catch up to explain why that mm-hmm. is, you know, how our bodies respond, not just, um, you know, physiological with immer- physiologically with immersion um, and with the mammalian dive reflex and all that, um, but that just being near water, not even getting in it, looking at it, walking by it, smelling it, listening to it, mm-hmm. um, that you know, our, our, our brain activity, our, our alpha waves, like, incre- you know, increase right. it, And that's, that's calm, relaxation, creativity. I mean, that's good stuff. And we know that to be true. Yeah. It's, it's no mistake that images of sunsets at beach right. beaches are on <laughs> right. meditation apps. And, <laughs> and, you know, there's something about the, the gestalt of the waves crashing mm-hmm. and the light bouncing off, yeah. you know, the surface and the smell too, mm-hmm. that, that, produces this calming effect that can't be replicated in other environments. And I just mm-hmm. know personally, when you swim, as somebody who runs and rides bikes and does all mm. different kinds of things, 
there's something unique about swimming, the experience of that and how you feel in the aftermath of it right. that is very different and unique and special. What do you think it is when you think about it? I think there's something about the submersion mm -hmm. and the muting of the sound yeah, the or quiet. the sound of what the waves, you know, what that does in your ear canal, you uh -huh. know, like, and, and, and the, the sort of suspension of gravity and the, the loss of feet, like you, you lose your sensation of your limbs in the same way that mm -hmm. you have on land. Like mm -hmm. all of those things combine to create this, um, you know, very different experience that I think is, you know, healing to the human body. Yeah. I mean, just mind. flotation, weightlessness, an unburdening, mm -hmm. I think is, is really what happens physically and mentally, emotionally, I think. You know, you can't help but respond to the medium in that way, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and there have been times, I mean, there are, there, I, you know, the, the swimming in my life has changed over time. I mean, it has played different roles, but um, especially over the last year, I think about getting in water as such relief, like mm -hmm. so profound from this fire hose barrage of uh, badness in the world. You know, I think yeah. just to have a momentary um, pause from that, a relief from that is just, you know, it, it is so, it's such a gift because it's so easy to do. Um, and yet, uh, not everyone does it. Right. Not everyone thinks to do it. And it's kind of the last frontier if you want to get away from the phone and all exactly, the signals yeah. and the noise yeah. and the I've stimuli. About that a lot. And it changes your perception and your relationship with time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's uncomfortable if you haven't done it before because you're like, wait, you know, I need to listen to music or I need to, mm -hmm. you know, like I, I, I'm not comfortable with not being overstimulated. And mm -hmm. you kind of have to like let that go. You are left alone with your own thoughts in a way right. that can How definitely be. <laughs> That is a, the worst, right? Why would I do that? I Why know. would I do that when I have But AirPods? now there's like these devices where you can get underwater audio and they're figuring that out. And I'm like, I don't want it. Yeah, I, I don't, don't want, want any that. part of that. I need to protect this place is the one place where I get away from all of mm -hmm. that. I think about, you know, they've had sort of somewhat crappy technology to do that for right. some time. It doesn't work so well. Exactly. And there's a reason why you don't see people using them mm -hmm. very often. I mean, by and large, I mean, I would say like in a pool in any given day, 98% of the people are not using right. anything like that. Right. I yeah. hope it stays that way. I know. You do too. Well, let's take it back to the beginning. I mean, you know, the obvious question is like, you know, why write this book? Like what, from whence comes your deep appreciation and love of the water? <laughs> Uh, I mean, I got to go back to my parents, right? By now I've talked about this story so many times, but maybe you yeah. haven't heard it. <laughs> maybe, I've heard it, maybe but the people listening audience, might yeah. not have heard it. So, my so this is the book tour. This you is, answer oh, these questions. This is the we'll, book tour that we'll I haven't never had. We'll go in different directions, but you got to, <laughs> I like this story. So it's, go ahead. It's a really good story. Um, my parents met in a swimming pool in Hong Kong, and that's our family origin story. Mm -hmm. And it has, you know, we when we were kids growing up and um, heading to the pool for swimming lessons and my parents would be there. And uh, and then over the years, we joined the swim team and we became lifeguards. And it always, pe people who came to know us laughed when we told them that our parents had met in a swimming pool because it was just, it was too perfect. Of you course know? <laughs> they did, right? Yeah, there's that black and white photo of your parents. They were, they were quite young when they met. They were, I think they were, um, I asked my mom recently and I think they were 18, 19, mm -hmm. something like that. I mean, they're just gorgeous. I mean, they just I have know. the hots for yeah, each other. Yeah. You know, I, I just want to read them. It's all them. happening. Yeah, I know, because I see them, you know, I, and um, I hate to say this, but that I have never seen them so happy. Mm -hmm. This beautiful, um, you know, unfiltered, I mean, the both of their smiles are so big, you know, and... Uh, and I and it is a memory that I never had myself, but I look at it and I like to think of that as a time when they were really happy, mm. you know. Um, so my dad was a lifeguard and my mom was at the pool. And um, but when we grew up, uh, they were always at the pool with us or at Jones Beach when we would go in the summers mm -hmm. and spending time together. It's just very much baked into um, my brother and my experience of our nuclear family because. Until I was, I guess, in junior high, early high school, my our parents were together ostensibly, and then they, my father, started kind of 
they separated, but we didn't really know it as such. And so uh -huh. he started traveling back to Hong Kong and then to China. He's an artist. He's a, right. you know, he's, I actually, for he someone. He won an Emmy. He won an right? Emmy. Yeah. yeah. He won an Emmy. And, uh, you know, he and I were so close when I was, when I was a kid. Um, and I was the one who accompanied him on trips. You know, we, I grew up in New York and Long Island mostly, and I would go with him to client trips uh, into Manhattan and we'd go to the Met and we would um, just, I would spend hours with him in his studio. He we were very close. And mm -hmm. so I associate, you were, you were telling me about, um, you wrote your college essay about swimming. I wrote my college essay about swimming and art mm. and writing. And those mm. things were, now that I think about it, uh, they still are me. You know, they, they, I knew from a young age that those three things were so essential to who I was. Certainly, it's it actually, I yeah. was visiting my mom this summer back in New York and she made me clean out the garage and I found my college essay and I thought, uh, it's very strange to be looking back at this person and um, understanding wh what stayed the same. Many things stayed the same. You know, essentially this uh, this relationship I have with the water and also with writing and creativity, that's something that I trace back to my dad. Like yeah. Very He was the so. permissive free spirit. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, he was fun and he was a kid and he's today at 73 years old, he's still a kid. He yeah. is, he, he actually hasn't changed that much, uh -huh. but I have, you know. Was your mom more of the taskmaster then? Oh, totally. Yeah. She was the strict one. I don't actually remember her smiling. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> it's so terrible. But um, you know, after they divorced, which was really, really painful, they didn't they didn't um finalize their divorce until I was in college. Mm. And um, but then I got to know my mom as this as who she was. She was a person who was not in relationship to my dad. She was fun, she had her own ideas, she was she had stories to tell. Mm -hmm. And um, I that's when I got to know her, you know, as a real person. You need both of those. Yeah. You know, I think you need you need the the artistic sensibility, but you need the the regimented person as well. Oh yeah. I uh you know she was the one who said, you know, my 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 desire for order, my desire to prepare like all of those things come from her, like my sort of risk averse mm. <laughs> older person self mm -hmm. is because of her. And, and I say those things lovingly and because I understand that those are things that you need to operate and be a responsible human in this world. And I take the fun and the creativity and the light from my dad, but I also know that in the context of our family that all, that really ruined our family, you mm. know, this sort of shirking of responsibility and um, not owning up to that. So profoundly, both parents have shaped me to be who I am. Mm -hmm. And I yeah, hope you came out I, pretty good. Oh, thanks. So it worked out, <laughs> you know. It could have gone terribly wrong. You go to wrong. Harvard, right? Like you, <laughs> so, you, but, but, and yet you're an artist. So you have, you know, you know how to focus and, you know, mm -hmm. organize your life. Yeah. But you can also be a free spirit and creative and, you know, follow these whimsical, you know, passions that you have to track down these stories. And yeah. That's, um, my mom, I remember my mom said to um, a good friend of mine, uh, and it was not in a, this was when I was 22 and I took off for a few months to go on a, on a fellowship to New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And I was, came back and I had student loans to pay off. And I said, oh, I really want to work at this adventure magazine. You know, they're not paying me right now, but I just, I'll just, you know, take a waitress, waitressing job or something in New York while I'm doing it. And she, she turned to my friend and she said, Bonnie is such a free spirit. And she, it was not a compliment, <laughs> right. you know. I was, so, oh, no. I was uh, but I said, I re but you know what though? To her credit, she, like a couple of weeks later, she said, you know, if you really want to do this, I will support you in this. Mm. And I did. I, I did it for six months. And then I got a job that paid money, actual money. And, and there we go. That but, was probably a big step for her. It was. Actually, now that I think about it, it really was. I have yeah. to ask her about that if she yeah, remembers. Yeah, yeah, But you grew up in and around pools mm -hmm. all the time. 
swam yeah. competitively, you and your brother. Mm -hmm. But you didn't end up swimming in college, right? You rode crew no. in college. Yeah. I By the time I got to college, and I wasn't good enough to swim in college, like not, no. I, But I was done with competitive swimming mm -hmm. because college to me represented like something new, like something right. super fun and exciting. And I always knew that I was going to, um, college was going to be the place where I got to meet new people and right. do new things. And I very much felt that I wanted to do that. Cause I wasn't, you know, I, I, I think I was a very old person when I was like a kid, uh -huh. <laughs> you know, I was like, I want to be 20 and I am eight, <laughs> something like that. I, I just, get it. just wanted to have autonomy, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and I rode crew. And I, you know, it was, it's so quintessential. It's almost, it's a cliche to be like rowing. Right. Sculling in the Charles At an, River. At an Ivy League college. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's like the Ivy is like, uh -huh. you know, within sight as you're on the water. It's still a water sport though. It is. Um, I want and I was talking to a friend about this recently. Um, you know, I love, I just thought it was so cool to have a different perspective of water. And when you know, when you're swimming, it's so solo, right? It's mm -hmm. a you're on a team, but you're, the experience of swimming is very much you in the water. And when you're in a boat with, you know, seven other people and you have to become one, you have mm -hmm. to move in unison. Almost all of the time, I would say like 98% of the time, you, you can feel like the slight tug of someone else who's not in quite in your sink. And then the 2% of the time when you are flying together. It's just so magical. It's like, it's as if you are taking flight and you didn't even, you're mm -hmm. not trying. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about this the other day because I wanted, I really loved experiencing water from a different perspective. And then um, I only quit because, uh, you know, you, you're looking at me and I'm not a giant person, you know, I'm probably mm -hmm. between like a coxswain size and a lightweight rower size. You're not small enough to be a coxswain. <laughs> I, I was, I was not, uh, I'm only 5'4". I was like, the, the coach said to me, your technique is great. I put you in stroke in this boat, you know, but you have to put on like 20 pounds. Uh -huh. And I had already packed on, like, I was eating like a crazy person, you know, and the, the freshman dining hall, I was right. working out in the weight room. I was erging like a maniac. And I just was like, I think I have maxed out. I don't know that I can gain any more weight to do this. Mm. It was weird. It was So you were like, I'm done? Well, and then I joined water polo. Oh, you did? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Again, another water sport. Yeah. But it was fun. I mean, it was it was hard. I just realized that um, after a while that um, – as playing a sport in college, and you know this more than anyone, is it's that's all you're doing. Yeah, it's pretty all encompassing, and um, I didn't want that. You wanted to broaden your yeah aperture, your horizons. Yeah, yeah totally. I get it. Um, what's What's interesting about your relationship to swimming in high school is that it the pool represented like this refuge for you, right? Mm -hmm. Like you had you know a complicated relationship with your peers in school, but at the pool which was a much more diverse, yeah. you know, it was literally a pool of all different kinds of right, people. Right. Um, it was kind of like a, a refuge, like a, a place where you felt at home. And I think that's worth exploring a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I really liked how you, you did this kind of archeological dig into the history of, you know, the United States and its relationship with swimming right. and in particular, you know, pool building and yeah. access to pools yeah. and how that changed over time. So let's talk about that a little bit. Cause I, I think it's, it's, it's pretty interesting. I know, like I grew up in the Northeast mm -hmm. and, you know, most high schools don't have pools, mm -hmm. whereas in other parts of the country they do. And that right. tracks back to our, you know, sort of checkered relationship with, with race and segregation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I really did not appreciate, meaning I didn't understand, um, the extent to which the current, um, you know, gap, the racial gap in swimming ability between especially blacks and whites um, in this country 
is so traced back to um, this era of segregation um, in our country, and it that it the fact that it persists to the degree that it does. I mean, I think the rate mm-hmm. is that um, the latest statistics show that um, black kids are five times they drown at a rate five times that of white children. Right. I mean, that is just ter- It's horrible. And I, um, you know, and then it's not just uh, swimming access and education, but it's also then when you break through to join a team, you find a team, you're swimming, you love it. And then you feel like you're the only one or you're the, you're, you know, swimming remains a very white sport. Mm-hmm. Um, and you don't feel welcome or you don't feel um, that you belong or that you have positive images and 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 stories uh i i think that 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 has a really profound effect on whether you want to keep doing something you know so like i was i recently got to talk to um the founders of an organization called black kids swim and um ebony roseman was the is the founder and she was talking about how when her daughter started swimming um and then i think the reason they started the the organization is because when they Googled like black kids swim, they would, they would come up with, um, the, the top Google hits were like black people can't swim or black kids don't know how to swim. Yeah. When I was growing up as a, as a kid, there was this trope like, oh, but you know, black kids can't swim. Right. They they, have a higher density, body density or something like that. Like some crazy reason why black people weren't good at swimming, which is just ridiculous. And then that is, pervasive and it mm-hmm. persists. And that's, you know, those are the like ridiculous things that I heard growing up too. Um, at the same time, um, I think of my experience, um, you know, as you uh, uh, pointed to, was really special for me because I grew up, um, I swam on a team that was in the next town over and it was a very diverse community. Um, Freeport, New York is, you know, uh, has a large African-American and Latino uh, demographic, and it also the team also ac- attracted kids from all across Long Island, and you know even though I was at one of the you know the quote unquote the onlys in my high school, a town away, two towns away, uh, that pool was super diverse. You know mm-hmm. the head guard, uh, you know the the at that pool where I lifeguarded, the Freeport Rec was um, was black. You know, and she. I don't know. It, it, I think to see, my point is to be able to see representation around you is no small thing. I really um, credit that experience with, I mean, making me who I am today. Yeah. No. The, uh, the section in the book where you talk about this era, you know, in the 1910s and early 1920s mm-hmm. when America was building these massive Mm-hmm. public pools, right? We've all seen pictures of that extraordinary pool in San Francisco that just oh, looked like the size pool. of a mall. Yeah. You know, it was like massive. <laughs> I think there was one in Chicago too. There were a couple yeah. of these gigantic, you know, glass ceiling, you know, like they look like arboretums almost yeah. that were gigantic yep. that went the way of the dodo, right? Mm-hmm. Like they just disappeared. Yeah, they were, so this was a shift in um, public pools from being, um, you know, during the progressive era, there were, there were pools for like, before that was public hygiene, you know, like the, mm-hmm. they were actually bathing facilities. So like working class and immigrants would go and men would go on alternating days with, from women. And, um, so, so it was much more a gender split with these pools. Mm-hmm. And then once they became what you described, these like pool palaces, basically, like pools then, public pools were then for recreation. And so then we're for families and we're then, um, you know, public authorities, you know, the, the sentiment was that uh, people of color could not swim in these pools with white people. And so there were, they were turned away from a lot of pools. Um, there were, um, you know, and then during the civil rights era, the public, the pool spaces, the watery spaces, the be- even public beaches, that they were sites of protest. Um, and uh, in the book, I talk about how uh, there was this incident um, called uh, a Bloody Sunday. It was like in at a public beach in Mississippi. And it's, it's where mm-hmm. Blacks went to 
be, you know, to use this public beach. And, and there, you know, there were riots and, and many of these pools um, that happened, there was violence. Um, and, and it, if you think about it, we're talking about how water is freedom, water is relief, water is so universal to all of us as humans. And yet this essential, um, this essential thing was not available to everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think the right of leisure, the right of recreation was something that was, was seen as um, symbolic of this fight for right. equal rights and equity. Yeah, and so ultimately these pool palaces closed down, they just yeah. shutter, right? Mm -hmm. And then hence begins this movement towards the backyard pool. Mm -hmm. So the, the public pool kind of, you know, isn't, a primary focus anymore because right. it's complicated for those reasons. Yeah, after desegregation, you know, you'd think that the fight is, you know, is over, you know, mm -hmm. equality won, but actually um, a lot of whites then, you know, of means like fled the public community pools right. and pull, you know, built their own um, backyard pools. And you'll see this, you know, in California, it's interesting, right? Because California, especially Southern California is such a, an epicenter for this backyard pool culture. And it's right. this beautiful, I mean, you look at these photos of like Palm Springs and LA and um, it is such a, it is this very golden light, um, perfect um, visual history. And yet where are the black people, you know, where mm -hmm. are the people of color in mm -hmm. these records? And um, and I think that that, that is being, rewritten and and pushed at and and you know that that uh beautiful bubble is being punctured um in a way that is um starting to be in 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 a way that is really important to our understanding of what those images actually meant and meant yeah. exclusion right it so. feels it feels like there's still some way to go though because the, oh, yeah. the country is littered with these public works pools mm -hmm. that are all over the place many of which sit drained right. and empty. Like that pool in Central Park at the north end of the park, mm -hmm. that massive pool, like most of the time there's no water in that pool. Like there yeah. seems to be a lot of um, establishments like that all over the place that either because they lack funding or for whatever reason mm -hmm. that I'm unfamiliar with, mm -hmm. they just don't, they, they're not really, you know, they're like in disrepair. And yeah, it's really expensive to maintain a pool. Yeah. And um, what I learned in this pandemic period, I was reporting a story about a re reopening of a public pool in my neighborhood. And I learned that most municipal pools, you know, the public pools that are run by cities uh, operate at a deficit, Do they? even in normal mm -hmm. times. So they're hemorrhaging money. And the, the, the season in which they would take in revenue is the summer, you know, camps and um, all like swimming lessons and swim teams. And for this entire year, they, they did not have any of that. And so now they're even more in the hole. And so now as, as many pools have struggled to reopen in, in some limited fashion, right? Uh -huh. So, but think about it, it's one lane per person. Right. Uh, spaced out. Yeah, if they were losing money before. Yeah, no, I, mean, now it's a I hate to think about what it means because um, the sad fact is a lot of these pools um, will not reopen, you know, yeah. even after the pandemic. And so that to me is, I mean, it's hard to stomach because that means then another generation of, of kids might not get right. what we had, right. you know. Um, and that's just really, it's hard. I, I think about, you know, in, in the course of researching this book, uh, I learned that swimming education is universal. It's part of the public school education in so many other countries. And I think that would be amazing, you know, if that were the case right. in this country. It would make right. such a difference. But but you need adequate pool access to do you that. And most schools, access. you know, don't have pools or don't have a, pro a pool that's proximate enough or right. is accessible. It just comes, it's it's a really huge funding issue, but I I just think about these, you know, in Iceland, you know, there's, every town has a, yeah. a pool. Every town. I know. Tiny, tiny town of like a hundred people has a pool. <laughs> well, let's talk about Iceland because this is a big part of the book. It's super fascinating. I mean, first of all, we should mention, you, you said at the outset that you broke the book up into these various sections, survival, well-being, community, competition, and flow. 
which kind of cracked the code for you and, mm -hmm. and helped you figure out a way in. Like, how do you write a book about swimming? Like, how do, <laughs> it's just like this ethereal, amorphous thing, right. right? But kind of planting your flag in these various categories provided you with like some footing to do this. Mm -hmm. A big part of the book or the, the early part of the book is about Iceland. And in particular, this one fisherman whose name there's no way I'm going to be able to pronounce. <laughs> but I'd never heard of this guy before. And it's an unbelievable story. I will tell you about Goodlooker Frit Thorson. How long did it take you to figure out how to let that roll off your tongue with ease? It's It's been some time, yeah. many years. <laughs> yeah. um, Say it one more time. Goodlooker Frit Thorson. Okay. But the thing that we have to know is that his nickname is Loye. And everyone calls him that. So I will- Loye. Henceforth, very good. All Call right. him Loye, because that's way easier. Um, so I opened the book with a story because how could I not, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's a story that my husband told me one night and I, he'd heard it from, you know, he works in with fisheries and the environment and oceans. And um, I think he'd heard it from an Icelandic friend. And this story is famous in Iceland because in 1984, um, there was a fishing vessel that capsized off the coast of Iceland and um, good looker for Thorson, Loye, was the ship's mate. And he was like, he was 22. He was super young. Um, but it was the the fishing trawl caught on the sea bottom and then, and then it overturned and everyone got thrown overboard. Mm -hmm. And everyone's in the water holding on to the boat's keel before it starts sinking. And, you know, this is bad news. It's 41 degrees water. It's freezing. It's the middle of the night, um, and they are, you know, they are unable to deploy the life raft. Mm -hmm. And the sad thing about it is that they were supposed to um, the self-deploying life rafts had become a sort of thing fairly recently at that time, and and they were supposed to have installed that in the boat, but they hadn't done it yet. <sighs> so this boat is sinking, and the you know, the few of them that are left are holding on to the keel. And then they say, you know, we're going to start swimming, Captain and, and Loye. And so they start swimming. And pretty soon he's the only one left. Mm. Was yeah. there a lighthouse? Like, how are they There's finding a lighthouse. their... lighthouse. Okay. Yeah. So, but it's six kilometers, at least six kilometers away. Right. So he's, um, it's the, the lighthouse on this island, which is off the coast of the main island of Iceland. It's called Heime. And it's part of um, the Vestmanniar archipelago. I've been practicing how yeah, to say that. You got that down. <laughs> the Westman Islands. Um, but he, so he saw the lighthouse, the light from the lighthouse and he started swimming and he's just swimming and swimming and swimming. And he's wearing like a flannel shirt and jeans, you know, and a sweater. Right. That part confuses me because I would just take that off. Like that's holding you back. <laughs> I think he took right? his sweater of off. I, I, I can't remember what the, I mean, he certainly lost his boots. But he's swimming and, um, you know, he's talking to seagulls and he, and it's, it takes him six hours, six hours, six kilometers, and he gets to shore. Now, the thing to understand about this island is that it is a volcanic island, mm -hmm. like all of Iceland. And I think it was 10 years before that, there was um, a volcanic eruption that had resulted in like the island got bigger by like 20%. Mm. But then there were also these like sheer 100 foot cliffs and like very spiky lava fields. So he gets washed ashore at the base of one of these 100 foot cliffs. So he gets there and he cannot get out. There's uh -huh. no way for him to climb. So he has to get back in and start swimming. So he swims around to a place where he can finally get out and he's walking across this lava field. And he's, you know, his feet are bleeding because it's really sharp and he like, there's a frozen, um, a, a sheep cistern. It's like a tub of water that feeds, waters the animals. And he like punches through because he's so thirsty. You know, he's been out there for hours and hours. And then he trudges into town and, you know, I think day is breaking and there's like a light on the first house and he like walks up to the house and there's like bloody footprints behind him uh. in the snow. And it is just insane because then they're like, I cannot, you know, they rush him to the hospital. They can't, they can't discern his like heartbeat. I mean, it's like very faint and his, or his like, they can't really read his body temperature, but he has no signs of hypothermia. Hmm. So like you and I- Yeah, that's crazy. 20 minutes max. We yeah, 41 degree water. We would be dead. Everyone Almost else everybody yeah. would die. 
And, he, and then how long was the trudge into town know, until he I got there? I, I really don't. <laughs> I don't even know if he knows. How, you know, how, he was the, delirious What was the air point. temperature? I can't remember what the air temperature was, but it was significantly colder than that. Um, and he, you know, they, he's just a little dehydrated. He's fine. Um, and he's, they keep him in the hospital for observation and it turns, you know, and, and it's not for some time when they have done some, um, research and studies that he's taken part in, but he has this, um, the reason he was able to survive. Okay. A, he's a very good swimmer. Everyone in Iceland mm -hmm. swims. He was trained to be as such as a sailor. Um, and he has, he's like a seal. He, his fat is two to three times normal human thickness. Mm. He's, it kept his, you know, core body temperature Was stable. he a fat dude? He's a big guy. He's six, four, I don't know how much he weighs, but I thought, you know, if you, you can see photos of him from that. He's not unusually gigantic, uh -huh. you know, but he's, he's a solid guy. But you think about plenty of guys who are really big, who would die very quickly yeah. in, you know, water that cold. It's not, it's not about the fat, but certainly the quality of the fat. Right, the quality or where the, if, is and the where fat is. subcutaneous in the right, right places yeah. to protect the organs. And yeah. It's, it's crazy, unreal. right? So he yeah. becomes this massive hero and also a science project for right. a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and he, he, he gets so much media attention that it kind of compels him to become this recluse. That's right. Um, and so you can imagine that um, when I came across this story, I thought this is, I got to talk to this guy because it just is so compelling. And I know that he doesn't, um, you know, he's told this story before, but has been a really long time since he talked to journalists. But of course, the first thing you find when you Google him is that this happened to him. And then also that he doesn't talk to journalists. Right. What, what soured him? on the whole thing. He told me, um, it just, he felt that his story was being um, misrepresented. And, you know, it, of course he started to feel harassed, right? So like his friends died. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a horrible he's tragedy. He's being celebrated for something that's quite tragic. Yeah, and I think at a certain point, you just wanna live your life. You mm -hmm. just want everyone to leave you alone. Um, and it kept kind of coming up and coming up and, and, to be honest, though, I, I mean, I want to I want to point out that he was very vocal in the first years after um, the accident because the conversation they had on the boat's keel was like, and he told me this later on, um, was if someone if someone makes it, they have to tell. And he said, you know, nine times out of ten, actually nine point nine times out of ten, nobody survives this, and so they don't know what happened. Mm -hmm. And he said. I was the person who could tell. And so he was advocating, he spent quite some time advocating for for the mm. mandatory- The lifeboat thing. Yeah, the yeah. like self-deploying life rafts. And, you know, they have the swim every year in his honor for like, you know, the last 35, six, seven odd years um, called Goodlugsund, which right. means good lookers swim. And it's everyone, it started out as something that the navigation college did, you know, all the sailors did with their clothes on to. Mm -hmm. But in a pool, right? In a pool, absolutely. Yeah, because yeah, everyone would die. Yeah. So that was the point, <laughs> you right? You can't have that. <laughs> I know they breathe them strong in Iceland, yeah. but, you know, not, Very hardy they're people. not that crazy. But it's interesting because he became this symbol of Icelandic resilience, right? It's it. They embraced him. And that story and the, you know, honoring him with the tradition of the swim, because to Icelanders as a people, like this is, this is what, he's like the epic symbol of their mm -hmm. survival resilience, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so he accepted that mantle, but then after a while, just, you know, he's, he's a very, um, well, so I, I really, it, it was hard for me um, to figure out then how can I approach him in a way that's- Right, how are you gonna engender trust from this guy who's been burned by the media and wants to be left alone? Right, there but was- you a... being the dutiful journalist. <laughs> I did you my play the, you, you played the long game. I played the long game. Well, there was a movie, I guess, um, not too long after I found out about his story, there was a movie by this like blockbuster Icelandic director, um, Cormacur, I think is his last name, Baltasar Cormacur. He like did, um, uh, some Everest movies, I think, with like 
Denzel Washington or oh, really? uh, Mark Wahlberg and Denzel Washington. Oh, I mean, wow. He's directed the, these uh-huh. like big blockbuster movies and he, but being Icelandic, he was obsessed with the story of Good Looker Fred Thorson. And, and, and when he, I guess he was a teenager when this happened and he said, you know, I, this to me is the story. This is like the adventure story. It's like, um, what does it mean to be a, a person in a speck in the sea and, and what drives someone? Right. And so he, they approached, the producers approached um, Loye about the film and he was just like, you know, I think at this point he was, he had kind of, things had quieted down. He was starting to live a life that was more to his speed. You know, he has grandkids, he has kids, he has a, you know, wife. He, he, had, he works, you know, he mm-hmm. still works in a fishing for um, a fishing uh, company. And um, he was just like, make the movie when I'm dead. Like, I don't want any part of this. So, But they made the movie. They made it anyway. They made it anyway. Right. And his- So he felt betrayed. He felt betrayed. And his, te- you know, to hit, um, you know, he lives in a very small town on a very small island in a very small country. Right. You know, everyone knows <laughs> him. The town, you know, protects him. Um. But people, so I was just like, okay, how do I, how do I follow my, you know, sort of storytelling instincts? And also I respect this person as a human. I respect his desire for privacy. What if I write him a letter? So I wrote him a letter. I wrote him a letter and then I ran it through Google Translate into Icelandic and then I mailed it. (laughs) But but you can't pitch, right? So what's the just, you know, I appreciate you. Like what is the letter? I think I said, um, I said I I think I told him that I was I was working on a book about swimming and I knew about his story and that I would love to just talk to him about what swimming means to him. I wanted to hear from him in some way, mm-hmm. right? So he he wrote back almost immediately, but he said no. Right. And then I thought, oh, that's oh, that's so disappointing. But then we started to have this like pen pal relationship. And we just and my, and I remember my husband had said like you could just write to him and see what happens, you know, just So we started because there's something about his opening message to me that seemed to leave the door open a little bit. Mm -hmm. He just said something about, you know, I have not had great experiences in the past with journalists. It has nothing to do with your project. But he said something in that email, and I'm trying to remember what it was. Um, Like if you, the the message being sort of, if you can prove to me that you're trustworthy. Not in so many words, but yeah, I got the sense. And um, so I just kept writing and, Mm -hmm. and I would send him you know, little bits of trivia or when I was in Japan, you know, doing some research, I would send him a photo from there. And because he, I think he said that he, um, he said something about swimming, saving lives. And, uh, and that was, and he used emoji. (laughs) I thought, Mm -hmm. would he use emoji if he wasn't leaving the door open a little bit? I don't know. It was interesting. Yeah. So I just persisted. And then I didn't meet him in person until a year later. And I still, like to the day that we actually met in person, I did not know if he was actually going to see me. Right. But you go out to Iceland. I go to Iceland. You end up getting an audience with him. And the guy ends up being like your buddy. He is this wonderful, funny, um, he loves jokes, storytelling. Like he's just um, a very endearing guy and he actually you know we, we got to the point where um he 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 trusted me with a story and then he um very quickly you know he had an interest in my family and we we went oh my god now it seems so long ago the summer of 20 last year 2019 we went to the Faroe Islands and we went to Iceland to see him and um you know he he and his wife being very experienced grandparents like they just had all these snacks on the table uh-huh. for my kids, you know, they just, and my kids adored them because they were just like, can we go visit Loya and Maria again? <laughs> like again and again and again. And to the, I mean, yesterday my son told me, he said, can we go back there? Wow. Um, and, you know, on, on, on Christmas, you know, he sends a, he sends me a text with a photo because he looks like Hemingway crossed with Santa Claus now. Mm-hmm. That's kind of exactly how I 
would envision him. He sent a photo of himself in a Santa suit and said, I think this guy says he knows Felix and Teddy. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> I mean, it was hilarious. That's like funny. he's he's a great guy. That's cool. But what did he tell me? I mean, he he told me his story, but also I, what I realized is that um, so much of what his story means is what other people say about him, what he means to them. Mm-hmm. So I tried to do this kind of twinning effect of like telling both stories at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, because it is about the stories we tell ourselves. Yeah. And on some level, it's his story, but it's the national story, right? right? And exactly. he's got to release that and allow people to have their own experience mm-hmm. with who he is and what what he endured. Yeah, I think that's right. But this kind of opens the book up to this, you know, kind of dialogue about not just human survival in the elements and in water, but also the unique properties of cold water Mm -hmm. and human exposure to cold water. And we talk about brown fat, like converting the white fat to the brown fat and all the new studies that are, you know, going on right now about how cold water exposure extends longevity and, you know, is healing to the body. Right. Um, One of the studies that I looked at showed, okay, so you're, you know, warm, what warm water versus cold water, right? So mm-hmm. I think it was like an hour immersion in 90 degree water is like very comfortable, very relaxing, um, you know, reduction in pain. You're just like, you're very, it's mm-hmm. a, it has positive effects on your body. An hour, a same amount of time in like 56 degree water or something like that. Mm-hmm. It was like dopamine levels through the roof, like metabolism revved up, like feelings of um, euphoria, <laughs> you know, I mean, and it is, uh, you know, and just like very alive wellness kind of, you know, things that are measurable, but also things that you experience that are a very acute, mm-hmm. you know, um, reduction in inflammation, of course. Um, and I just think, uh, it's so interesting, um, you know, the way it, it, it speeds up our metabolism. It's actually like on its face, cold exposure, is not that great for you, right? So like cardiovascularly, it's like terrible. It's It just mm-hmm. like jacks up your um, blood pressure very quickly at first. And then over time, you actually, it lowers your blood pressure because it's just your your heart and your um, blood vessels are then able to handle it. Over time within a single session or with repeated exposure? With repeated time. exposures, yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, we talk about... Uh, where the the sort of longevity um, a scientist I talked to, Hiro Tanaka, he was talking about how he went to Japan, back to Japan where he's from, and he studied the ama, right? So those free diving uh, grandmas, really, uh-huh. like you know, they're they're pearl divers, the pearl divers, um, you know, diving for shellfish, um, and they a lifetime of cold water exposure, right? Their cardiovascular, um, their ability, their cardiovascular health is amazing. Mm. Um, their hearing is terrible <laughs> because yeah. the cold water really destroys your hearing. But they, um, their, you know, he wanted to know about um, the, you know, their, like how were their arteries, you know, the, were they flexible or had they, you know, was it like, was their experience, you um, over time had that made them something a little bit more akin to um, a marine mammal, you know, just like how they're um, able to, um, you know, cope with with uh, the water. And he found that they were, like they're just, their cardiovascular health was really great. Hmm. Um, and, you know, I, I think they live to be quite old, you know. And um, the traditions, I think that there's been renewed interest in just, again, like these people who um, hew to thousand-year-old traditions and are able to do things that we wouldn't imagine doing, you know, in our modern day. And they're not dying young of heart disease. Right. Yeah. Um, And and that, you know, uh, Hiro Tanaka also did research with arthritis, you know, and and cold water and swimming. And what I was really interested in was that the swimming practice uh, 
lessen the effects of arthritis, you know, from a pain perspective, from an inflammation standpoint, from mobility, uh, increased mobility. And those effects lasted for much more, be, much more time beyond mm. the actual time in the water. And right. so it's just like it, the benefits are, 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 um, enduring. And I found that really compelling. Yeah. That's super interesting. Yeah. So your way into this cold water world quickly becomes our mutual friend, Kim Chambers. That's right. Who be, who's a, a looming figure throughout the book. Like yeah. she's, you know, other than yourself, like almost the primary protagonist throughout yeah. this. I mean, how narrative. can she not be? <laughs> I know. Well, she's larger than life. I mean, she's just, I, I just, I love her so much. And I just think the world of her, she's amazing. But she brings you down to the the Dolphin Club and introduces you to the whole aquatic park. The whole ecosystem crew. Exactly. That's, that's exactly yeah. what it is. It's an ecosystem. Yeah. And it's a very explain what that is. I used to live around the corner from there, so oh, you did? I, I never. I mean, I've swum in Aquatic Park yeah. many times, and but I've no, swum from Alcatraz and uh -huh. you know all of that. But I was never like a member of the mm -hmm. Dolphin Club. I only know a few of those people. I know Vito and yeah, a couple yep, other yep, people. Yep. But it's a. I mean, so the Dolphin Club and the South End Rowing Club, um, they've been around since the late 1800s. They they share an actual building, mm -hmm. you know, but they're. Clubhouses, kind of rivals. yeah, they're rivals, yeah. but they're friendly rivals, and they love to trash talk, and um, and and they are very much uh, the the members are like diehard bay swimmers, cold water swimmers. Most of them, you know, take pride in the fact that they don't use wetsuits, mm -hmm. do it year round, and have this. I mean, there is a celebration of like the hardiness, the vigor, the um, you know, how long to stay in and, right. you know, and, uh, not cool to go and swim in an aquatic park in a wetsuit. <laughs> well, you can't, you, you know you what? Can, so the but, first time I did it, oh, I was afraid. That's cute. Right? <laughs> I was afraid I was going to get ridiculed, but you know, people were very nice to me, but they just said, you can't bring your wetsuits into the, into the clubhouse. <laughs> yeah. They said, right. leave them outside. And I'm like, okay. Uh, -huh. uh, it's almost like, um, you know, when the wet wetsuit, like there's like a, there's a line that's like a no, mm, no passage right. through the space. No Wetsu shall enter mm -hmm. the space. Uh, but so it's this, and it's all ages, like all body types. Um, it is amazing to me that, um, that there's this community there. It still amazes me mm -hmm. and I've seen it and it's just beautiful. And so Kim you know, Kim's the first woman to swim from the Farallons to San Francisco. She is the sixth person to the Ocean Seven. And she did all of this um, after almost, I mean, I'll, I think all of your listeners will probably be familiar with her story, but that she almost lost her leg to amputation mm -hmm. after this accident um, where she fell down the stairs. And she, it took her two years to relearn how to walk. She was embarrassed about her scars. And part of the rehab was like, you know, maybe swim, you know, and she by her own description, was a horrible swimmer when she started, had horrible technique. And then one day uh, she's invited by a couple of guys at the pool to, to swim at the Dolphin Club at Aquatic Park. And she said, this is a, I love the way she describes this. She, she describes um, her, you know, not, she says not many people have a, a visual record of their rebirth. And she said that they happened to like video her that day mm -hmm. when she got in the water and started swimming. And she said like, you know, here's this like broken, skinny, like um, 120 pound woman who's just like, um, has been through hell and, and is like the biggest shit eating grin on her face. And uh -huh. she's in this water and she feels so alive and she feels so, um, she feels reborn. Like it literally was her, it, it started this completely new life for her you know, as a marathon swimmer, as a freakishly accomplished marathon mm -hmm. swimmer. And I think a large part of that, of course, is that she is a very resilient person. Yeah. Right? Um, she also talks about how she has a very, very high pain threshold, which has gotten to her into a lot of trouble, you know, Why? over the years. Well, I mean, the whole thing with her leg when she fell down the stairs that day. She kind of ignored it. She ignored it. Mm -hmm. And she drove to work and then her leg was like twice the size. Right. And then she passed out and then she got to the hospital and it was like, you, you know, all that swelling was killing all the nerves in her leg and they almost had to, you know, amputate her leg. And so 
she laughs at it. And, and again, of course, then that pain tolerance, um, of course, allows her also to do extraordinary things. Yeah. Um, and she also had uh, a bout with a couple of bouts with Guillain Barre. Right. Know, um, and That's more recent. More recent, yeah. How is she doing now? She seems to be doing um, pretty well. We talked um, recently, a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, she's swimming, you know, during, during the pandemic, she was, she's back in the bay swimming. Mm -hmm. um, and she's trying to knock out the seven summits also, right? Is that, did that get tabled for? That was being? her big goal. I think when, and that really was, I mean, she was, she was well on her way mm -hmm. when Guillaume Barre happened to her. Um, and I don't know if that's something that's still on the table, right? but she wanted to be the first person to do both of those things. Yeah. Nobody's ever done that, have they? Don't get any ideas, people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's Kim's Listen, thing. Listen, I'm not doing it. <laughs> but what's, you know, even additionally compelling about her is not only her, her, you know, love for cold water, like she took to it immediately, right. her freakish, uh, you know, endurance capacity, but also this interesting relationship with fear because she mm -hmm. swam from the Farallon Islands, you know, to San Francisco. <laughs> that the is not shark for the faint infested. Of she did it heart. at night too. You can't see anything. Like I just, it sounds like my worst nightmare. <laughs> it is you pretty know? much everybody's and worst she's nightmare. she's like, oh, she thought it was fun. You know, like it's, <laughs> you know, so that's an, an, a, a thing on top of all of this that right. makes her, separates her, I think. Right. The fear. I mean, she'll be the first person to talk about um, how she was afraid so many times about, um, you know, the, like people seeing her scars. You know, that's one thing. I mean, d just that she had changed so much from that person who fell down the stairs that day. Mm -hmm. um, and then over the course of becoming this swimmer and then, um, you know, breaking these world records and um, uh, then coming to this point where she wanted to make these swims bigger than herself, right? So then turning her attention from her own struggles outward to say, okay, if I have a voice, what can I use this for? And she did that Colibri swim. Um, the Red Sea thing? No, the one, well, that one too. Yeah. But the one across the border. Um, oh, right, in from, Mexico. Yeah, yeah to yeah. Tijuana. Uh -huh. um, and that, you know, she did that with uh, Mexican swimmer Antonio Arguez. And they were like the ambassadors, you know, across the, and it was really to call attention to all the deaths at the border. You know, it was, she, she kept saying that it wasn't, she didn't want it to be political. She wanted mm -hmm. it to be about life and mm -hmm. caring about life. And she said when they swam across and got out the beach in Tijuana, all these uh, school kids were on the cliff wearing the Colibri t-shirts right. and cheering. And she's like, it was this, it was like wanting to use the swim as a, as a way to bring people together. And I, and I really, I, I, I so admire her for, for all of the, you know, this evolution that she's gone through mm -hmm. in her life. I mean, she always talks about how, and I, it's hard for me to um, imagine this, but she said she was a really shallow person. Like before all of this. Really? Yeah. You can't imagine it, right? She's no. like this glowing light. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but something got activated in her. Something got activated. You yeah. know. And in the Venn diagram of these various buckets or categories that you've divided the book up into, you know, she overlaps, you know, survival with community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, she is mm -hmm. that bridge. Because, um, you know, not just the healing part. But the, you know, she survived so many things in her life because of swimming. And then what, and swimming was the thing that kind of brought her back from both her leg injury and then from Guillain Barre mm -hmm. and um, was a way for her to rehab her life. She really did do that. Mm -hmm. um, but it was through this amazing community at the Dolphin Club. And I, I think about, I remember being in the locker room there, the locker room. And that's something that I super miss in this time, like the locker room at the pool. Right, the, the post swim. Just like the chatting yeah. <laughs> and the secrets and the, um, and you're you're in everybody's, you know, intimate space, but I don't know what it's like in the men's locker room. I actually wanna, wanna ask you about this <laughs> because it's not, I mean, at least from my perspective, uh -huh. it's like this, I think Kim has described the Dolphin Club sauna as like a hen house. Like everyone's just sharing like, you know, stories of like illness or, 
boyfriend troubles or um, things that they're struggling with. I don't know what it's like mm. on the other side. Well, it's changed with different phases of life. Yeah. You know, but I think the the unifying principle is that when you complete a swimming workout, you're kind of, it's like this pipe cleaner for your mind and your soul, right? Like mm -hmm. you emerge from that experience, like feeling very grounded and and also open, right? So mm -hmm. then when you go to the, like, you know, like, listen, when I swam in college, you everybody goes into the hot showers and is in there forever, right? You right. don't just quick, take a quick shower and get dressed. Like <laughs> you, you stay in that hot shower as long as possible. And there's a lot of, you know, yeah, there's a lot of conversation that goes mm -hmm. on there. And even in master swimming, yeah, it's the same. For sure. Um, I mean, I don't know what the women's locker room is like, but like, there's a, yeah, there's a lot of, you know, bonding. And I think yeah. it's it's different with men because men, you know, are, are um, it's harder to get men to, you know, have kind of intimate conversations with their friends and their peers, but there's mm -hmm. something about that locker room experience that's yeah. conducive to that in the wake of just enduring like a difficult workout together. Right. And, you know, maybe it's the same in track and field or any other sport, I don't know, but yeah. um, it's certainly, you know, a tight knit bond mm -hmm. that you have with those people yeah. that, you know, you do this hard thing together. And even though it's individual, mm -hmm. you are doing it as a collective. Mm -hmm. Right. You're doing it. You're doing it apart together. Yeah. 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 That makes it interesting. Um, well, let's talk about the uh, the well-being component of this, because I think there's a lot of people listening who either are swimmers or people who are perhaps intrigued by the idea of maybe getting into cold water for the first time <laughs> or you know, trying to learn how to swim when they didn't learn as a kid. There's so much well-being to be mined from this sport or just this activity. I mean, I, I also want to, you know, we talked a bit about the the physical and physiological benefits, right, of mm -hmm. immersion. But I also want to talk, um, you know, the, a big part of the well-being is the flow, mm -hmm. right? It's the flow state. It's, it's where your mind goes. Um, when you're doing it. And I think, again, what's so interesting about swimming and makes it unusual and unique in the sort of sports world is that you are, um, you're alone, you're in your head a lot, your senses are muted. Mm -hmm. um, you're not really talking to someone else. I yeah. mean, even if you're doing a workout together, or even if you're doing a long swim together with someone you know, in the bay or in the ocean or whatever, you're you're not chatting the way you would if you were going for a long run together. Mm -hmm. And so your um, your awareness. I mean, I think it depends on. Okay, so I, I want to talk about two things. Like pool swimming is super different from open water right. swimming, right? So in a pool, what's so great about that is that it's this very known, circumscribed, every, the distance is known, your body is, it knows where to do the turns and, you know, you, you, you can, your mind is freed in a way that is different from open water because open water, you have a sort of acute nowness. Yeah. Um, you that need I, a little bit of hypervigilance yes. in open water. Yeah. Um, and... Even if you're someone like Lynn Cox or Kim Chambers and you're swimming for like a shit ton of time, uh -huh. like just so long, you are still attuned to what's going on in your environment in a way that's like, again, you're at at attentive to dangers, um, potential dangers, although your crew is probably supposed to be doing that. <laughs> but when you're out there, I mean, you're, I, I find that when I'm swimming in the bay, I'm constantly scanning, you know, it's mm -hmm. this you can't really stop yourself from doing that but even if you know of this place um there's still some alert you know and i think that then then the acuteness and the presentness of being in the water is like again like taking you out of that your head and all the shit that's going on outside of that mm -hmm. like i think to be to be forced to pay attention to that moment right you're just compelled to be in the moment and present yeah and you have for that hour or 45 minutes or whatever, you have forgotten about just everything. All of the things that are holding you down are occupying, preoccupying you. And, you know, right now there's mm -hmm. plenty of that. Yeah. Um, but I mean, actually, I, I just realized like in, in this conversation with you, the way a great conversation can take you out 
I haven't t- thought about COVID for a while. Right. So thank you for that. <laughs> okay. You know, like I that's gave you a one hour magical. reprieve yeah, from that. Yeah, I really appreciate yeah, that. But I just, just to, but I'm distracting <laughs> you, right? But to be, you know, so that, you know, being in open water is a, I don't want to say distraction because distraction sounds negative. Like distraction sounds like, um, it's not quite the right word because it seems like it's something that you shouldn't be mm-hmm. focusing your attention on. But it, it compels your focus in a way that I think is super useful and um, again, it's a relief. It's 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 a it's a breath away from the rest of everything. Right, right. Your normal state of being, your normal um, land self. Um, and then in a pool, it's I find it no less. Um, I know a lot of people don't love swimming in pools, um, but I really love pools. I do too. And when people say it's boring, I, I don't find it boring at all. No. There's something about that constriction like how can you stare at the black line the whole time but because you know exactly how long the pool is and you Mm -hmm. know that your environment is static essentially Uh that gives you the opportunity and safe right that you don't have to think about it right and it allows you to to like live in this state of presence but also kind of the and you talk about this in the book as well like this liminal state right Mm -hmm. where you're not you're not you're not on land you're not underwater Mm -hmm. you're kind of in between and there's something about that that place that puts your mind in a in a in a place to problem solve or yes. you know to be in this active meditation state, and that's very related to the breath, of course. And you yeah. talk about that in the book as well, like the regulated you know inhaling and exhaling that comes with that, that you know has some impact on your you know sympathetic nervous system in a certain particular right. way. You're allowed to wander. I mean, you're allowed to make connections, and things are floating around. And you, they're they're not tethered in the same way. I think mm. that um, again, I come back to the quality of the medium. It's like there are things don't have to be connected in the same way. At least for me, I have I have interrogated myself many times over the writing of this book when I'm swimming. Like, what the hell am I thinking about? How am I thinking about these things? And um, you know, I wrote a great amount of the book in my head when I was swimming. Right, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> because I had Well, I'm to sure come you back. get stuck, you go swim, and yeah. then by, you know, not focusing on it, you are allowed, you're able to free associate and solve right. that problem so that when you are, you're in the locker room afterward, you're like, I got yeah. it. I think that's the, um, I love that term, the, the soft fascination, right? There's something that's um, holding your attention, but not too um, closely. So that you're able to um, do that free association that you're talking about, Mm -hmm. which is so great. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's different from running. Like running Mm -hmm. is analogous, I suppose, but the experience isn't quite the same. I mean, definitely not for me. (laughs) I don't know about you. (laughs) I hate running. I mean, I love running too, (laughs) but the feeling that I have afterwards is different. Yeah. It's different. Yeah. Certainly swimming makes me more tired and definitely more hungry. Oh, so hungry. I don't know. Why do you get so hungry? And also, talk to me about this. When I sw- After a swim workout, I have to pee like 400 <laughs> times. I cannot yes. stop peeing. Yes. What is going on? I, that doesn't happen to me running. It's weird, right? I, yeah. I, it's got to be have There's to some do something about like the hydrostatic pressure or yeah. something on your body that somehow then you're like, every, all the water gets forced right. out. <laughs> I literally have to go to the bathroom like 10 times over two hours. If afterwards. there's someone listening who knows why this happened, please email <laughs> yeah. us because we want to know. I think I tweeted that know. question out really? one time and I got a bunch of answers. Were any, it was a well, long time ago. But did any, there is some biological okay. reason. I think part of it has to do with being horizontal. Part of it has to do oh, with interesting. the, the temper, water temperature. Yeah. You know, the, even even when you're swimming in a 75 degree pool, it's still so much colder than your body. So right. your body is expending a large percentage of its resources just to keep you warm yeah. on yeah. top of, you know, the exercise that you're doing. Yeah. I think that the tiredness and the hunger, and also it's like a delayed thing, right? So you're not really thinking about, I mean, I don't really get hungry when I'm swimming usually, but then like, you know, sometimes I'll be in the shower and I'll just be like, holy shit, yeah, <laughs> give I know. me a, I'm, I'm so hungry. Yeah. I know. But I get freaked out open water swimming. Do you? Well, I don't, I don't mind it in tropical locations where I can see everything, but uh-huh. in the Pacific, it's so murky 
and yeah. I don't like not being able to see the bottom. And then your your mind <laughs> starts to wander. Oh yeah, to, in a bad way. You know, you're you're part of this food <laughs> chain. You're unbelievably vulnerable, and then it's difficult for me to like relax and enjoy it. Well, part of that is definitely the temperature. Um, do you have particular moments that you recall as being super terrifying in open water? Um, I mean, I will say that when I'm with other people, it's fine. But uh -huh. sometimes I want to just go by myself, but I'm reluctant to do that. I just don't yeah. feel like that's a responsible thing to do. So I, I've done it, but then I'm nervous because I'm alone and no one quite knows where I am. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the things about open water swimming in the time of COVID was I, I, I kept telling myself that you have to be more conservative than you might be otherwise yeah. because you yeah. don't want anyone to have to save you. And I got freaked out when I did the Alcatraz swim, this is mm. a very long time ago, mm -hmm. my buddies and I did it without a wetsuit. Um, Cause we were, you know, 25 or whatever. <laughs> and it's like, you're a puss if you wear a wetsuit. So we were, we did it without wetsuits. And I just remember being halfway. I mean, it's not that far. What is it like a kilometer and a half or something like that? It's like a, what is it? A mile, mile and, and a half, half maybe. Yeah. Um, being in the middle, like, perhaps like smack in the middle. Mm -hmm. And I just stopped for a moment and looked around and I was like, I'm in a shipping channel. Like yeah. that freaked me out because there's oh, massive boats out there. They come and they're on yeah. you in a So it wasn't second. the marine life. It was like the fact that like there's gigantic cargo ships right. that pass through there. Um, but my hands and my feet got so numb. They just felt like nubs. You're you know? like doing yeah. this, <laughs> the fist <Yeah>. swimming. <laughs> I didn't do that again without a wetsuit. I um, had a similar experience when I was doing my Alcatraz swim, and then I hit a patch of seaweed. And you know when you hit something when you're swimming, you you can't stop yourself from doing that jerk yeah. upright. And it was like my heart was like in my mouth, and then I just was like, oh, seaweed, 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 right. because you're just you can't. You're right, you can't see anything. Yeah, and it it's freaky. Touches you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not really afraid of shark. Like if I'm in Hawaii and I can see everything, even mm -hmm. if I saw predatory um, fish, like I don't know that it would scare me that much. I've been recently, I've been working uh, for the last couple of months on a story about fear and that involves a shark, um, uh, involves sharks and uh, someone who spends a lot of time with them. And I was thinking to myself that I, have never it, sharks haven't been a thing for me either, right? It's not mm -hmm. something that has occupied my mind. But I also have, have been really intrigued by how it occupies the imagination of so many people who would never encounter sharks. Mm -hmm. They but but it lives in their imagination, and of course, Jaws. But also that it um, it's like a convenient receptacle f for your fear, right? So right. it personifies whatever fear that you have. Yeah, and actually. It just is a way for you to um, deal with it. Like yeah. it's it's all of these other things. Um, and when we were just talking earlier about the you know being in the dark deep ocean and the sharks like that being the the most profound fear or the right. scariest place like in anyone. Like a primal thing yeah. that we and have it inside is. of us. Yeah. Do you know this guy Michael Muller, this photographer who's done all these. Um, photo essays on great whites and he swims outside of the cage and he, it's mm -hmm. incredible. He's, yeah. he's on the podcast yeah. and now and he's creating him. this virtual reality. Oh, um, really? Series where you put on the goggles and, you know, basically you're swimming with great whites outside of a cage. Have you tried it? Um, he let me test it in the middle of the podcast. We took a break and I put okay. him on and checked it out. It's, <laughs> it's wild, right? But they're using this now in kind of a um oh like a kind of fear conditioning exactly yeah yeah to work with people who have ptsd mm -hmm. and you know other kinds of fears to help help them like process all of that in a healthy way yeah i think that that fear exposure or exposure therapy is really interesting um and i and i think it's fascinating how vr can help with that mm -hmm. um and i'm really curious about how the technology you know because the so much of the earlier iterations of it have made people so nauseous. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. The... Yeah, I think there's they're still working that out. Yeah. I got a little bit like that. You know? <laughs> I think I would have then develop <laughs> a, a, a fear of nausea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I, but it's, um, I think, I don't know how you could possibly solve for that problem, though, because your body, your inner ear is just doing whatever it's, I don't think that you, how do you correct that? You know, I how do know. you 
I don't know. Solve the disconnect, I mean. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. You can talk to Michael. You should, yeah, yeah, I'll hook you up. You (laughs) should interview him. Um, When you look at Kim or people like Lynn Cox or Louis Pugh Mm -hmm. or Martin Strell, like these epic, you know, super long distance swimmers, Louis like swam in the Arctic Circle, right? And didn't Martin swim the Amazon? He swam the Amazon. He did like a ridiculous amount of butterfly too, didn't he? Did you, do you, yes, are you aware of this? Yes, which I think is hilarious. I, I'm like, I don't, how is that? He's like, he swam the whole Amazon River butterfly. I'm like, that's not humanly possible. He I don't know what kind like of butterfly he's guy. doing. <laughs> but like, it can't be the butterfly. What's that, your form like? <laughs> I, yeah, I would like to see that. It's still crazy impressive. I can't imagine. I, but like, what is it that these people share? Um, Definitely a high pain threshold. Uh, I think there's def- I uh, what I um, what I have gleaned from talking to some of these incredible endurance swimmers is that they 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 are different. They're definitely different mm-hmm. from us, or maybe not from you. You're you're an endurance athlete. I don't like cold though. <laughs> go ahead. I think cold is a is a is a divisive thing. Yeah. Amongst I mean, us I like it after I've done it, and yeah. I've put myself in that situation for that it. reason. But I, yeah. I'm not like Kim who I like, can't wait to get into yeah, the cold water. Sh- right. She just jumps right in. Um, they're very, there's like a certain single-mindedness, I think. Um, and certainly an ability to, I think, disassociate from their bodies in, in a lot of ways because their bodies are enduring so much. Not just with the cold, but with the, the length of time and the distance that they're swimming. Um, but they seem like they have all kinds of different reasons for, um, that they say that right. they're doing Right, well, Lewis, it's, it's very much about environmental preservation. Like he has a big why, you know, a big right. purpose behind yeah. why he does what he does. But he also talked about how before he started doing that, um, I think he was a lawyer. Wasn't he a lawyer? I think so. Um, and then just started, um, yeah, I, I think that he, he so wanted to swim. He kind of developed the reasons, reasons to swim over the course of time, but he was a very driven person. So like, I, I think that these athletes are, do start out as very motivated people, Mm -hmm. whatever it is they're doing. Kim, Kim was super motivated, like doing her, you know, and her, um, you know, Silicon Valley job right. before. Adobe, I think. So I think that they have just turned their focus and vision to something that they can really go all in on um, in a practice that rewards that, right? Yeah. Um, and it is very extreme. Like I, I don't, I, I, I am, I think I'm having trouble talking about it because I don't understand yeah, it yeah. myself. You know, even in the in the competition part of the book. And actually this is interesting. I asked Lynn Cox and I asked Lewis Pugh about competition, right? Cuz and Lynn really chafed against me um asking her that question cuz she said I'm not competitive. I'm not swimming against anyone else. Um and then it kind of as she can still be internally competitive. Exactly. And then actually was she kept talking she chafed against it because she didn't see it as um she she didn't see it as being externally motivated by what anyone else was doing. I think that was the thing that she that rubbed her the wrong way to to think about. But she you know she she is the she is concerned with it though. Like it was about being the first and the you know coldest and the longest. Right. Um, but it was against herself for yeah. sure. I think that uh, because once she started to talk about it, it became this. It was clear that mm. she is a competitive person, mm-hmm. even though she didn't necessarily like to think of it. Herself but with Kim, way. it all seems so easy. Like, cause she's yeah. always laughing and smiling, yeah. you know, yeah. like, hey, nothing but a thing. Yeah. Oh, but her. she is like, she's but got she's some fierce. shark in her. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Did you talk to Ross Edgley? I didn't talk to Ross Edgley. Ross Edgley, um, I remember, God, I remember when he did. What was the it's last? Like, uh, it was uh, a year and a half ago, I yeah. think, when he did the Great British Swim. It was, the book was done. But mm-hmm. I remember reading about that and thinking he would have been an interesting guy. Yeah, and he's he has great. his own book. He's uh, great. Yeah, yeah. He's. I mean, he. I mean, he's also a force of positive energy. Uh-huh. Like he just. He really. He's 
he's insanely fit and yeah. like trains like a madman, right. but he's always laughing. Like it is play. I mean, this is another theme of the book, mm. like the relationship between swimming and play. And um, Kim has that. Ross definitely has that. Like he's a beast, mm -hmm. but he's literally constantly cracking jokes and just, you know, lighting up whatever room that he walks into. He's very charismatic in that mm -hmm. regard. And what's interesting about him is he looks like a bodybuilder, yeah, he's, but he has unbelievable endurance. So he wrote uh -huh. this book about, you know, this um, combination of endurance and, and strength and how that works. Mm -hmm. Cause you would think like, oh, you gotta be really lean to be able to do something so long, mm -hmm. but he swam all the way around Great Britain. It was bananas. And he, Crazy. he documented the whole thing along the way. Like he had the rashes on his neck. I remember from his reading about were that. Just like I just, yeah, you just got like open, so I mean, like gaping, gaping by the seawater like too. On week one, ah. you know, when he's doing this, and he came out into the podcast like right afterward. Like he literally had just completed did you see it, like, his like, scars? Like, yeah, did he's he got show a you? massive scar. He was putting duct, you know, that heavy heavy duct tape on oh, it God. and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Um, but he's somebody who, you know, grew up as a water polo player, mm -hmm. was kind of a competitive swimmer, but not mm -hmm. at an elite level or anything like that, and just comes up with these events to do. So he's internally competitive. He's mm -hmm. competitive with himself and mm -hmm. he's battling the elements, but it's right. not about, there's never anyone else that he's competing against other than himself. Right. And, and the elements. Yeah, I think that you, um, to do all of these things, you, you have to have some motivation that is just very consuming, you know, whether it's externally motivated or internally, it's, it's just, it is. And, and I think that you, because you've had conversations with all kinds of people who are pushed to do extraordinary things, I'm sure that the sort of like outset, you know, what, you know, whether it's something that they were always striving for approval from someone mm -hmm. or that they always just wanted to, um, know that they were capable of something more um, than what everyone told them that right. they could do. Um, or whether it's for some, you know, I want to raise awareness about some, but it is like, it, there is, the, how do we talk about it is important. Yeah. Um, I, I suppose that it's not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily matter how, what it, what the specific thing is, but mm -hmm. there's got to be some force that is compelling us to do it. Right. I loved the backtracking into the history of, of swimming and in particular competitive swimming, mm -hmm. tracing it back to its roots all the way to Ben Franklin inventing the hand paddles, yeah. which was like, <laughs> that just blew my mind. I can't stop thinking about that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he, um, he is the true Renaissance man. He yeah, of course, he, of course he invented <laughs> course hand he paddles, did. you know, it's unbelievable. Um, and that cave in the Sahara where oh, yeah. it was basically a tomb, right? Where there were drawings of people swimming in a pond when at one time very long ago, the Sahara was a lush- Green, the green Sahara. Green area. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't the desert. It right. was dotted with paleo lakes, you know? Mm. Um, I love that story. I love that, um, the, you know, the first human record of swimming is in the middle of the d desert right. know, in Africa. Because of course it is. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that you look at these images and it really looks like people are just breaststroke, breaststroking up the walls. Mm. And um, I also love that the the Hungarian explorer who discovered that cave at the time, Lazo Almas, he wrote a book about it, and he speculated that there were actual lakes and bodies of water around the cave at the time that the, the drawings were made. And of course, the theory of climate change then was just outrageous and so radical. And he was like, his, edi um, his editor reportedly was so like upset about that, that, that he put a footnote that said, I don't subscribe to this like harebrained idea of... That at one time there was water in the right. middle of, of course, Sahara. Right. But of course he was, was right. Yeah. Um, but at that time it was pretty radical. And um, now of course there's so much evidence about about mm -hmm. the green Sahara and that there are, you know, hippo bones, tortoise shells, like um, fish, you know, you know, middens right. of clam shells. Like it's just amazing to think about. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, and to think that humans' relationship with water dates back to the inception of mankind. Yeah. And and certainly before any rec, you know, this is this is probably dates back up to 10,000 years ago, but we likely knew how to swim way before that. Mm -hmm. It's just that there's right. no 
there's no trace of no it. evidence. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's talk about the samurais. Okay. The, I the love martial art of swimming. <laughs> this is something else I had no idea about, which is super cool. Um, so there is, of course, there is a swimming martial art in Japan. So Nihoneho is uh, the term for it in Japanese. It's the Japanese classical swimming art. So much like judo or kendo, there uh -huh. is there's the practice. And it originated with the samurai um, during the feudal period of Japan. And think about all these parts of the land that had to be protected by these different samurai clan, clans. And because of Japan being an archipelago and there's different, you know, there could be on the ocean or it could be on the edge of a lake or a river. The clans each developed their own schools of swimming. So they had different right. techniques for how to protect uh, their, you know, the, the land that they were protecting. And um, there are these, one of my favorite tidbits is that the sort of egg beater technique um, of synchronized swimming has its, has been described in samurai scrolls, like hundreds wow. of years old. Mm. And if you think about some of the things that they taught in these uh, schools of swimming, they're called Ryuyu, I'm not pronouncing it right, R-Y-U, um, that, uh, you know, you would learn how to cut through breaking waves with your arms, like in a parallel fashion, or that you would learn to approach in a, a very calm lake, you know, submerged like most of your body right. submerged and you would learn to leap up out of the water into a boat. There's uh -huh. a, there's a move called the flying mullet. You can also Google this. <laughs> the <laughs> See flying on, mullet? Yeah, on YouTube. But this is from a warrior culture. This like is this is how you, be, you know, use water to your advantage. Exactly. Yeah. So it is much in the same way that now martial arts, you know, they are practice, right? They are a physical, but also a psychological practice, a philosophical practice, a whole body practice and mind. And I love, I loved learning about Nihoneho because it it was a different way to think about swimming outside of this Western idea of um, competition mm -hmm. and racing. Um, and it is fascinating because uh, you know Nihoneho is still practiced in Japan today and there and I went to Japan to research this and, you know, in the Tokyo Olympics, they were supposed to have an ex exhibition of. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, I, I spoke cool. with the, um, the, a lot of these masters of different schools of Nihoneho who I, um, were preparing this exhibition to kind of in reintroduce to the world and perhaps introduce for the first time what the sort of foundation of um, Japanese swimming, you know, the national team success that we know it today, so much of it breaststroke, right? right? So like they've been, Japanese swimmers have been really dominant in breaststroke for a long time. And there is an interesting historical Ooh, link to yeah. the techniques of Nihon Eho. Um, I mean, I remember talking to um, one of these masters of of the the art and and he was trying to explain, and we were, we were observing a class um, in Yokohama of, of these swimmers, um, taking this, the, the class. And he said, you know, he was, we were observing the glide and the certain formations that they mm -hmm. would be swimming in. And he said, you know, you know, Kitajima, you know, Kosuke Kitajima, which right. is like the- The world record holder uh, in yeah, a breaststroke. Right. right. Just this dominant breaststroker known for like this incredible glide. And he said, that's Nihoneho. Like he wow. was just like, that's the skill that we teach and that has been ingrained into like coaching. Mm. Yeah, it's it's fascinating um, to track that, uh, you know, the antecedent of Japanese swimming success back to that practice. And right. I didn't know that the Japanese were so dominant at the end of the 1920s, like the 1934 Olympics, they won like 12 right. medals or something like that. I had no idea that- They like blasted onto the scene, it, yeah. You know, back then. <laughs> That was crazy. Yeah. And it, it's all rooted in this practice, mm -hmm. which my sense is it's not quite a Tai Chi thing, but maybe um, where they might share some sensibility is this idea of learning how to use, learning how to work with the water, like mm -hmm. being symbiotic with the mm -hmm. water and using it to your advantage. Like we all know the swimmer who isn't so experienced and 
they're in a race or in a triathlon or something like that. And they're, mm-hmm. they're, they're fighting the they're water. Fighting. They're, they're, it's they're, obvious. They're, they're making the water work against <laughs> yeah. them. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and really, you know, swimming is about fitness, of course, and technique, but it's really about finesse. And it's, it's this um, delicate relationship and this touch and this feel that you develop over time and some have an innate talent for where they just know how to flow with the water and make it work for them. And mm-hmm. those tend to be the most successful swimmers. I think that the Tai Chi um, analogy is really salient in mm-hmm. this in this context. I mean, it is about um, working with the element and figuring out how to use it to your advantage and be really efficient mm-hmm. too. I think that's something that um, people don't really think about with swimming and they think that it's like you said when when there's when people are starting to swim are starting to learn how to swim competitively and go fast like there's so much muscling there's so much over yeah. like windmilling you know you're just trying to like overpower it with brute force and really it's about like your timing your angle of entry your the position of your body in the water. And if you have that, it's actually quite, you're not expending a lot of energy. Right. Um, one of the things that's interesting about Lynn Cox is that her buoyancy is such that in, in salt water, she's like neutrally buoyant. So she's in that perfect um, body position to be swimming for mm. hours and hours and hours and miles and miles and miles mm. because she has that. Unique, she's riding a little bit higher than yeah, the average person would. You know, And she's talked about that. And, um, so that also helps her, you yeah. know, with her very, very long swims. Um, but it's also about touch and finesse, like you said, yeah. for sure. And in this practice, they have much like karate, like you get lines on your cap or whatever, yeah. at each like <laughs> level that you achieve. I think it was like stripes in some cases. Oh. Um, cause I asked them, I said, how do you know who's the master? And they said, look at the caps and, mm. and they all have their special caps. And I, it was so cool to learn about it. Um, and I, I hope to get the opportunity. I actually w- had been trying and planning to get to the Tokyo Olympics so I could see that, mm. you know, happen, um, see that sort of reintroduction of, of um, right. Nihaneho to the right. world. But What's your sense of whether the Olympics are going to happen or not? Oh, my gosh. Well, can they make a bubble big enough? I don't, I don't know. know. Yeah. <laughs> right? What do you think? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It's changing so quickly. I mean, the spikes that we're seeing right now make yeah. me feel pessimistic about it, but yeah. we'll have to see. But at some point they have to make a decision. There's so many moving pieces and so right. much money at stake. They can't just snap their fingers right beforehand and say it's happening or it's not. Like at what point do you pass that point of no return in terms right. of the green light or the red light? Well, now we're getting, and then we'll, we'll be getting into the point where then it is in the same year as the Winter Olympic but, yeah, year, know, right? right? Again, which is kind of I know. ironic. I know. Can you imagine being an Olympic athlete and, oh, and living in that oh. space of not knowing? Yeah, it's like a state of suspended animation. And right. I think it's so, I so feel for those athletes who are not knowing, you know, they're yeah. training and then they have had to calibrate their training for another year. And I think it will like break a lot of people yeah. if, if it doesn't happen. I mean, it'll play to the advantage of the younger, less experienced athlete, I suppose, sure. who 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 benefits with additional time. But there's so many people that are hanging on and yeah. trying to make ends meet while they do it. Right. And without that certainty, it's probably really difficult to get sponsor support. Right. Like it's just gotta be really challenging. It turns out it's expensive. Yeah. To, to be an athlete. It is, right? <laughs> It's expensive to live. Um, Another idea that I really love about the book is this idea that to be a swimmer is to be a seeker on some Mm -hmm. level. And and when you track through history, there are so many leaders and great thinkers who had this profound relationship with the water from Thoreau to Lord Byron, Mm -hmm. you know, even JFK, like people who would gravitate towards the water in times of crisis or as a daily practice to basically help them be more self-actualized, better human right, beings. Right. Um, I love that FDR was the one who put the pool in. Right. You know, FDR put the pool in the White House and it lives under the White House press pool briefing room, which mm-hmm. is just 
Is that why it it's called the press pool? It cannot get better than that. I don't actually know. I've never quite been able to pinpoint if that's why. Mm. But um, I recently had, um, yeah, I, I recently was talking about this with someone, and um, you know, one of the reporters at NPR who who goes the who reports on the White House said, "Yes, you can see the tile." So you'd be in the room. So it's underneath the room, uh -huh, right. but you can still see the tile and like where um, where the pool actually is is a is a bunch of like internet servers and stuff. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I thought that is oh, and that Hillary Clinton wanted when they moved into the White House, she wanted to reopen the pool again. Yeah, as a pool. Somehow that didn't happen, but. Um, I thought, wow, that would have been great. Right. Well, I know JFK swam a lot. And in particular, it was very helpful when yeah. he was in the middle of the Cuban Missile Crisis yeah. to try to like get some distance and, and balance so he could solve this unsolvable problem. Isn't it fun to think about swimming as like a, a hidden actor in, in these moments of history, right. maybe? Yeah. That's a good one. Well, and imagine being FDR, the freedom you know, of being able to get out of the wheelchair and move your body. Well, and that he hid his... Yeah, nobody knew. You know, yeah, his he hid his... It was so hard. Um, and then it finally became, you know, uh, impossible to hide um, his physical, you know, limitations. Right. So how do you think about that relationship between being a seeker and being in the water? Um, well, I... I I mean, I certainly think it's true for myself. Um, one of the, I, <laughs> I wrote my first book, um, American Chinatown, about how I noticed that when I would go to a city, I would, the first, the first thing I'd do, I'd look to see if there was a Chinatown and I would go uh -huh. and kind of see. It was just interesting. It was just a, a little window to see how is this place different or the same um, to me across the, the, Chinese diaspora. And then I realized what I do with swimming is that I look for a place the to swim. Pool. Yeah. <laughs> a pool or body of water. And um how often is the pool in Chinatown? Oh, well, there's the Chinatown YMCA <laughs> yeah. in San Francisco. There you go. Gorgeous pool. Uh, but uh yeah, not that often. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Turns out. Right. Um, but I I don't know. I think that water, I think. Water and seeking it is something that, for me, it's about finding freedom. It's about finding a new perspective. It's about finding a new way of looking at things. And I mean, isn't that what being a writer is? Yeah. So I think for me, it's like these two things are hand in hand, um, for sure. About how my, my mind works that way. Mm -hmm. What's the longest you've gone without swimming? Oh, that's a great question. Um, even when I tore my ACL <laughs> many, many years mm. ago, oh God, I remember this. I had that stupid machine that like moves your knee at night. Uh, and my husband made me sleep on like the couch because uh -huh. he was like, I'm not sleeping next to that thing. <laughs> oh God, that was like, what, 15 years ago. Um, I wasn't out of the water for that long, but I, but it's because it's rehab. It's recovery. It's like one of the first, like the only things you could do when you're, you know, recovering from surgery mm -hmm. in, many, in many cases. Right. It's interesting that when people get injured on land, they send them to the pool to right. repair themselves. Right. And then they go back on land and injure <laughs> and themselves. And then pound, pound the crap had, out of their bodies. Um, yeah. I had Laird Hamilton here the other day and he's got these legendary pool workouts, you know, and, and part of the philosophy behind it is that very thing, which is when you injure yourself and you go to physio, they teach you all these rudimentary like things and you kind of do right. them for a while and then you're healed and then you stop doing them. And he's like, we should just keep doing them. And what if we do some of the more rigorous exercises in the pool where mm -hmm. you remove the thing that's making you injured in the first place and create this supportive environment that allows you to do more with less risk. Laird Hamilton is basically saying what every physical therapist is like yelling yeah. at their at their right. patient and saying, just keep doing, <laughs> keep doing it. it. Why right? don't you keep doing it? My brother's yeah. PT, so oh, he is. I hear right. him so he hears lamenting yeah. all the time. Like, and he says to me, because I said my my elbow and my shoulder were, were sort of bothering me the other day. He said, 
So did you stop doing the exercises that I gave you? Of course I did. I I could go back and swim. (laughs) So that was in the past. So then I stopped, of course. Right. Um, Let's talk about this guy in Iraq, uh, Iraq, who who was teaching swimming lessons. Because this is another Uh, cool story. I didn't know anything about this guy. um, Like a foreign service dude. Jay Taylor. Um, This is another story. Actually, this uh, section of the book came, he was also another pen pal of mine, but he was a pen pal like a, a many, like a long time ago. He had read something that I'd written for the New York Times about um, swimming as a last refuge from mm. connectivity. And he said, you know, I have a story for you <laughs> about how it brought people together and it was about community, about connection. And um, he was this foreign service guy who got sent to Iraq for a posting for a couple of years. I think it was 2008 to 2010. And it was a time when um, Baghdad was seeing a lot of, a lot of activity, like shelling activity. Yeah. And so it was a pretty hairy time to be there. And he was in the green zone, which at the time was part was in situated in Saddam Hussein's Republican palace. Now, I don't know if you know this, but Saddam Hussein and his sons were very fond of swimming. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so at all of their palaces and homes around Iraq, they had these crazy pools, like just, again, like luxury upon luxury in the desert is like having a pool that you keep filled. And, um, this pool had multi-level diving boards. In fact, you can see um, there are some, I don't know if they're still up, but there are some YouTube videos of mm. uh, service soldiers. Yeah, them. soldiers like jumping uh-huh. off of the diving boards, um, which doesn't actually, it doesn't, seeing, watching them doesn't speak well of us. I don't know. There's just something well, sort of- Well, we just, we descend upon the palace and take it over yeah, and turn it that, into like a playground. It's yeah. that kind of like imperialist- um, view that has so gotten us into trouble. But anyway, so, um, but in this time of war, of course, there is a community that forms around this pool because of course, everyone is drawn to this yeah, oasis. Yeah, want to be at that pool? Yeah. And suddenly they're like, wait, we're allowed to use this pool? It is like got fountains and tiles and diving boards and it just is glorious. And again, it's peace. It's finding quiet. And he said that when he um, would get in this pool, he would just then that's when he stopped hearing like the firing range mm. like you know you'd be muffled and otherwise it's like this incessant noise of like military exercises and um you know there the the people who were there were from all over the world you know they're diplomats soldiers un peacekeepers translators local iraqis who were you know there providing support and he saw that that pool was again like everyone all the animals flock to the watering hole right mm-hmm. but this in this case it was like a psychological space like a coping mechanism a coping mechanism and um he was swimming he he taught swimming lessons for a long time he was a lifeguard you know had grown up in uh, the baltimore suburbs i think dc and he he has you know great form and he uh started to teach let people would come up to him and say hey you got any tips for me and he would see his colleagues flailing around in the pool and he would offer some tips and he's a very like when you read the book you understand that he's just like a very kind he's a teacher he's uh-huh. like a he's his his joy and his role in life is to be a teacher you know he's a very and to do it and and uh, and you've you've encountered many coaches over your life as have I and the best coach is one who kind of instills a little bit of fear, <laughs> but yeah. all, but but that but that you want you it's authority. You seek that approval. Though. You seek that approval. I wouldn't say that he's a person. Oh, I don't know what what he is like as a parent, but um, he's a very gentle guy at this point in his life. But you see that he has this quiet authority that you want to. You know that he knows things, and you want him to share them with you. Uh-huh. And so he was able to kind of. I mean, I, I think of him as a Pied Piper of all of these swimmers in in the green zone because he kind of was. He yeah. ended up building this, you know, Baghdad swim club of like a roster of 250 some odd people who rotated over two years uh, and 
would be teaching swimming less. I mean, they, they kept mm-hmm. having to add classes because right. they kept coming to inquire. It's like a feel-good movie. Yeah, it's totally a feel-good you know? movie. <laughs> yeah. Jay Taylor, folks, you can contact uh-huh. me for the rights with him. Um, <laughs> I didn't realize what really struck me aside from that story is this discussion around, um, you know, how beautiful the sunsets are mm-hmm. and like how people would swim like sort of at dusk or at dawn, like not, not, mm-hmm. not at high noon, it was too hot. Uh, but when the sand would kick up, yeah. that's when you would get the really epic sunsets. Mm-hmm. But that was also the danger signal because right. that's when the incoming mortars would yeah. occur, right? Because that sand would obscure, mm-hmm. um, the ability to find the people who'd been hit. Right. Right. You, it was cover for, um, it was a good mortaring opportunity. Right. And it, it's just like to exist in that reality. Like you're in this, you have this pool with fountains, but right outside of yeah. it, like people are getting shelled. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he, Jay almost got hit by a mortar. Um, in his trailer, like on the third day he was in Baghdad, you know, he, he really almost didn't live to, um, have this club, you know, teach Mm -hmm. these people to swim. And it is, it, it sort of underlines this, um, just how, again, porousness between states. And one, that's one of the big themes of the book is like, we're, I think with swimming, What's so intriguing to me about it is that it is a sport, it is a practice, it is something we do for exercise, but it is it is it is the difference between life and death and water. Mm. That is the reality. I mean, that is crazy. And we don't we don't dance very often. It's that close these days to death. I mean, last year, this past year is has been an exceptional year to that. But in our modern day, we don't experience that acute acuteness. Most of us don't anyway. Um, Most of us are lucky not to. And so I think sports, of course, competition is a way to experience this acuteness of being, right? This, Mm -hmm. um, the adrenaline rush, the, um, the urgency of feeling just really alive. And, and oftentimes that, you know, that feeling is something that we, we kind of can only really approximate um, with something that's a very heightened experience. Right. But swimming allows you to practice literally putting yourself in an unnatural environment. Yeah. Right? One that can really, again, uh, and, and certainly, especially with the ocean, can really rob you of that life in pretty short order if yeah. you're not careful. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to scare people, but no. but it is. But I don't it, think about that. Yeah. Like I, you know, that doesn't occur. I'm so acclimated to swimming, like pool, forget about it. Like mm-hmm. I don't think of, about yeah. pool being dangerous no. at all. Like it's just, that is my natural habitat. Right. I'm more hyper aware of that when I'm in the ocean, of course, but. Right, but you were talking about how you don't from, like it. Yeah, I know. I mean, that's <laughs> definitely a thing, but. But like in the pool, like the idea that I, that something bad is going to happen to me is not anything that I think about. Yeah, yeah. And that, but think, that is a very real thing for a lot of people. Right. I mean, and I think that's super interesting. And I wanted this book to explore that with that reader. I wanted to acknowledge that reality, that that fear is real. Like, so the people who don't like swimming, who are afraid of the water, that is very, uh, that is a profound fear. And that is, is something that once you get to, you know, to become an adult, to be a certain age where Mm -hmm. you feel that that door is completely closed to you because that fear is so profound and it's so, um, primal. And it is something that you have to be fucking brave to actually push past that and, and say, I want to learn how to swim. Yeah, and I've talked to to quite a few folks who, um, you know, had recently started to take lessons or had um, uh, started to try to address their, you know, their their fears and their lack of swimming ability um, over the over the course of the last couple of years, and it's, you know, it is very much tied to like some bad experiences they've had maybe when they were kids. Um, 
but also there's there's just a lot of emo- there's a lot of baggage. Well, you're there. very vulnerable. You're yes. essentially naked. Yeah. You know, and you're putting yourself in this environment where you can't breathe. Yeah. And your whole <laughs> life you've like said talk to the hand. You know, so it, it is it is courageous. Yeah. It's doable if you mm-hmm. submit to the process. Yeah. You know, you're. It, it is a weird thing. It's like violin or you know anything else. Like if you don't learn it when you're a young kid, it's a lot it's hard. harder when you're older. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that you can't do it. Um. And I know plenty of people who learned later in life and yeah. just love it you yeah. know, now. And it, it does serve, you know, everybody has their own relationship with it. I know that your relationship with it has changed over time, as has mine. But what will always remain consistent is this, you know, flow-like experience that mm-hmm. you have in water that I, I can't replicate in any other way. Yeah, You cite uh, like Moby Dick in that, right? <laughs> like this idea of sea dreaming, like... Like meditation and water are wedded forever, which is a line out of that book. Yeah. Keeps me going. Yeah. It is meditation. It is and it isn't. It's a specific type of meditation. It's moving meditation. Mm -hmm. I think that's actually someone had told me um, recently that they stopped doing yoga once they discovered swimming. (laughs) Really? (laughs) Because it did serve that for them. function for them. Yeah. 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 I'm not surprised, but you know what? It's better when you do both. <laughs> They're different. <laughs> they you are know? different. They yeah. are different. And, and surfing is a whole different thing, right? Which is another aspect of swimming, I suppose, on some level, but yeah. its own unique relationship with water and, and symbiotically living yes. with the elements. And timing. I mean, I, I thought about that this morning um, when I got out was just, you have to but it's the same principle of you have to time it right, you have to read the water right, and then you have to move in just the right way to get on the wave. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, it's not pretty. Yeah. So I suppose you're going to swim for the rest of your life. I hope so. They better I open sure the pools do. back up soon. <sighs> yeah. Right? Yeah. I know a lot of um, mer people out of water these days. Yeah. They're just, they're not the same. Don't you feel more just I, I feel like when I get in water in the morning I'm just a better person I just yeah. feel like it's all smooth yeah, back way way better yeah. I'm way more capable and when I said they better open the pool soon I let me please like couch that in the context <laughs> like I'm not saying be unsafe I just wish we could be in a situation yeah. where it was where pools could safely open yeah um because I know that I'm a better person and yeah. I enjoy it and I and I miss it yeah, I, I know you do too. What do you? Let's close it with this thought, which is, what is it that you you know want people to walk away from after reading the book? I think it's a sense of possibility, right? Um, I just think about water these days, and I've given this a lot of thought lately, um, especially because I can't do it. I can't do it as readily as I once could and take it for, and I took it for granted too, like anyone else, right? Mm -hmm. Um, That I could get in the water whenever I wanted to and find that peace, find that, um, you know, smoothing back of feathers and that time with myself. And now it's like this juggling act of trying to find, again, like the lane reservation or the window where like I don't have to manage all, you know, stuff at home with my kids and work and whatever. And my husband who only supports me, by the way, getting out in the uh-huh. water. He's just like, go. Please go. Go, please yeah. go. We'll all be happier Does he for swim? It. He is, he's a pretty good swimmer. He enjoys the water. He hates the cold. He's like you. Yeah. He will not get in the cold water. I mean, we, we woke up the other morning and it was, it was like, you know, one of those mornings that where you could see your breath. And yeah. that's not that usual here in California, guys. Many this places. time of year, though, yeah. I mean, it's high 30s at night here, but then it'll be 82 right. by like two in the afternoon. So we got up and it was before dark and I was getting up to go surf. And he looks at me and goes, boy, what I really want to do right now is jump in the freezing <laughs> ocean. 
<laughs> right. I, I just uh, ha- had to laugh because I said, you know, that actually, I mean, I know it sounds insane, but it sounds pretty good to me. And that's yeah. why I'm leaving. I love you. Goodbye. That's hilarious. You know, and so he understands me uh-huh. for sure. It took me a long time to come back to that kind of appreciation, though, because I was so steeped in competitive swimming for yeah. so long. And the yeah. idea of the early morning alarm clock, you know, and then standing on the freezing cold deck in the dark. And I was like, I do not need this in my life anymore. I did that for many years, yeah. you know, but I've kind of come around mm-hmm. to, you know, fall in love with it in a new way, as long as I don't look at the pace clock. Because that will give you PTSD. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. is going to do yeah, it. Exactly. Yeah, I, I think it is interesting. And I love to hear you talk about how you had you had to come around full circle from from what was a very intense and formative experience in your life, mm-hmm. you know, which is to compete at a collegiate level in a very competitive school. And very gratifying and one of the highlights of my life, but also extremely difficult and not without its traumas, right. you know, and yeah. like I needed to do other things. Mm-hmm. So there was a long period of time where I didn't want anything to do with the swimming pool. Yeah. I mean, you have to have enough distance from it and also to understand that, yeah, like you're at a different stage of your life. And I think- you know, I, I I like to think about how I came back to swimming as well. Like I, there were times when I wasn't as present in my life and, and now <laughs> it's going to come roaring back <laughs> Yeah, um, in a very wonderful and, and real way. Do you have a sense that you're more creative when you're swimming consistently? Like you're, you're more in touch with your creative voice? I think so. I mean, and, and again, like it was not something that I thought about until I, wrote this book. Like I did not, you know, examine or interrogate why Mm. I wanted to get in the water and then would go and sit and write. But unconsciously you were, you would not Uh, have been compelled to write the book, right? right? Or been interested in exploring that. It kind of nudged me that way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. For talking to me today. I love the book. Um, Please go check it out. It's called Why We Swim. It's a very direct title. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and it, it, it answers that question. Um, I really loved it. And uh, I'm so happy that the book is being so well received and so successful. I know you've got another book, right? About, uh, it's like a children's book about a f- woman, big wave surfer. It's um, it's Sarah and the big wave. And it's about Sarah Gerhardt, the first woman to surf uh-huh. Mavericks. Yeah. Is she the one that's in Riding Giants? She's... Um, I don't know in the Maverick in segment? Ra- oh, she probably was. There's one woman that's interviewed around Shh. the Mavericks discussion in that's, that movie. I, but I mean, I can't it's been so long since name. I've seen yeah. that documentary. But um, yeah, it was, I mean, she, 1999. Mm. And she's in, she lives in Santa Cruz. She's a, you know, she's a professor. You know, it's, it's right. like, it's so, she's a, it's a wonderful story. It, it, um, and, and it was my first children's book. And it was such a joy to write. So fun. How did you find, like, do you, I assume you got an illustrator to work with? Mm-hmm. Um, Sophie Diao, she, they asked, my publisher actually asked me, like, they don't normally do it. So in publishing, I, I only just found this out uh-huh. when I encountered this. It was um, usually children's books. You think that the, you know, the writer and the, and the illustrator is working together. No, it, they, it's like usually the writer writes the book. And then they find an illustrator and parent. Really? Yeah. No right? way. Right? It's because it's all these books seem so. How is that um, possible? Like you have to imp- be some part though. Yeah, exactly. But and and usually the publisher does not consult the author. The publisher just chooses. But in this no case, way. they let me choose. And she said yes. They don't consult the they author. They don't do that. They it's go like and a, get some illustrator. It's two lanes. It's like, um, and 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 they have the author and they have the illustrator, and they do the pairing. That's. Like ninety percent of the time, isn't that fascinating? That's shocking to me. I know because it seems it like you seem have like to have it work. braided together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess it works, <laughs> but I, I, I feel like they yeah. they're missing out on an opportunity. Is what I'm saying. Yeah, I think so. Speaking of which, why didn't you read your audiobook? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I I don't know that the the option was offered to me, but they should have just said I'm doing it. <laughs> They asked me, well, again, they asked me who I wanted. So they gave uh-huh. me a bunch of um, different professionals. Maybe they just thought they needed a professional. But 
I thought Angie Kane. She did a great job. But I just think because you're so much a part of the narrative yeah. that I would have I would have liked to have heard you read well, it. Well, thank you. Next yeah, time. Next time. But Put it was... your foot down. <laughs> it's your book. Now I was throwing my weight around yeah. all the time. Um, cool. Well, come back and talk to me again sometime. This I was really fun. To. I appreciate thank it. Thank you, Rich. Um, where should I direct people who want to learn more about what you're up to? What's the best place? You're on Twitter and all the things. I'm on Twitter and Instagram and all the things. Um, you can find me on my website at bonnytoy.com. Mm -hmm. Easiest way to do it. Do it. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Go, let's go swimming. Let's do it. <laughs> Peace. <laughs> Plants.